Hello, welcome to Global Business. I am Imewari Uhiyomokai. Today on the program, we shall be looking at the issue of net neutrality, data protection, and of course, competition in the information and communication technology industry. So we're going into the ICT industry today and talking to two lawyers on Talking Point, and they will be telling you what ICT streaming services or internet service providers, how they rip people off, or how the FCC, that's the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Council, can protect consumers from being ripped off by ISPs, that's internet service providers. Of course, we have other segments of the program. We're going to also be telling you how not to be broke. What are those decisions that you should take not to be broke? Our Chinese financial expert, Chink, will be talking to you on the program. It's a full package. Sit back, relax, and let's do business. Allow me to share with you the 10 reasons why people go broke. Reason number one, because they do not prioritize savings. You know what? It's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. Second reason why people go broke is because they do not set a budget. If you don't have a budget, sky's the limit. You will have the tendency to overspend. You know what? Income is limited, but expenses are unlimited. Third reason why people go broke is because they lack financial discipline. There are a lot of people who can earn much money, but the problem is not the money that they earn. The problem is the lack of what? Discipline. If we lack discipline, we have the tendency to overspend. As I always say, money is not a number thing, but it's an emotional thing. Reason number four why people go broke because they live beyond their means. Their capacity is only to spend 20,000 but they're spending 25,000 pesos per month. Even though you make 100,000 pesos per month but if you spend more than 100, you'll be broke. Reason number five why people go broke is because they borrow money in order to support their lifestyle. One thing I've learned in life you do not ask your income to adjust to your lifestyle, but you ask your lifestyle to adjust to your what? Income. Reason number six why people go broke is because they support too many friends and relatives. It doesn't really matter how much money you make, but if you support too many people, your income will never be enough. Reason number seven why people go broke is because they have what? Vices. 
doesn't really matter how much money you make but if you have vices like gambling addiction you know what will happen all of your hard earned income will go towards those vices and it will not only affect your financial life even your personal your family life will also be affected reason number eight why people go broke because they do not set up emergency fund it doesn't really matter how much money you save but if you do not have an emergency fund a loss of job a loss of income a loss of your business immediately you know what will happen all of the money that you have saved will be drained reason number nine why people go broke is because they make bad financial decisions before you make any investment business decisions it's very important that you need to seek the counsel of the wise people who had made it and become very successful I as always tell learning from other people's mistakes experience is the best teacher and the final reason why people go broke is because they lack financial education that's the reason why I always encourage people to read books attend seminars find coaches and mentors who can really help you guide you in order for you to make wise financial decisions if you're able to avoid these 10 things in order for you to really avoid being broke you are already on your way to becoming wealthy this is chinkitan saying to every problem there's always a solution if you're not part of the solution you're part of the problem always chink positive Welcome to Talking Point. Uh, today's program will be looking at the telecoms industry, telecommunications industry, and looking at what is called net neutrality and how uh, it, it, it competition can be, a, uh, competition regulation can be a viable option for protecting net neutrality in the telecommunications industry. You will be understanding what the net neutrality is. And, of course, how competition regulation. Of course, you know that we just had a, a new law signed into, or new act signed into uh, law by President Muhammad Buhari. Uh, January 30th, to be precise, that, that created the Federal Competition Commission, which was formerly Consumer Protection Council. So we've got guests on the program today, and uh, we've got uh, a competition lawyer. Yes, someone who I say I'll be referring to him as a competition lawyer from this point on because I hear there's a lot of money in competition law. So by the time we'll be talking to him next, he may be in his private jet. <laughs> anyway, Leonard Ugwaja is a regular guest. He's been on the program for many, to many times and uh, he's here with us to talk about the competition aspect of the law. Thank you very much, Leonard, for coming on the program. You're welcome. Again. Thank you for And having joining me. us is uh, Chukunyere Izogu. Chukunyere Izogu is someone who is very versed in net neutrality, data protection, and all that has to do with the telecommunications law. So we'll see how Leonard can affect truths. <laughs> Thank you very much. But not in a very, very, in a very platonic way. <laughs> anyway, so welcome. Now, let's talk about net neutrality in very brief terms. Chooks, what is net neutrality? Net neutrality, it's actually a telecoms policy whereby ISPs are obligated not to discriminate against traffic they transmit. Basically, it means that all traffic should be treated equally because the internet is seen as a dump network where traffic it goes in on the first come, first come basis. Sorry, can we take that again? Okay. Good, good. Yeah. Then, then explain what traffic is. Yeah, it's traffic, traffic ISP. <coughs> okay. okay. Let's start again, sorry. Okay. Basically, net neutrality is a telecoms policy issue whereby ISPs are obligated to treat all traffic, well, the content they transmit through their network equally. It means that at the fundamental level, all traffic should be treated equally. Whatever goes in first must come out first, first come, first come basis. You know, that's basically what it means about net neutrality. Okay. So how does it affect the telecoms industry, uh, this net neutrality, and how do you uh, how do you apply it to the 
telecommunications industry. Net neutrality itself is typified by several conducts that actually um, exploit or affect user experience while using the internet. I'll give you a particular scenario. When a traffic is being discriminated against, it could be that the ISP is actually throttling it or degrading user experience to the advantage of another traffic. For instance, I mean, sometimes we understand that streaming media could actually be prioritized over others, but those others that are not non-prioritized traffic could actually be degraded to the extent that user experience is so bad and so poor. So that's basically at a fundamental level what net neutrality is all about and how it can play a role and how it plays out in a typical telecoms scenario. Now, I know that for a viewer out there, they'll be wanting to know, uh, they want it to come into practical terms. Could you use like a telecoms A, telecoms B uh, example to, 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 to give an example on how net neutrality, which I believe is a positive term, would work? Thank you. Let's consider this hypothetical scenario. I am an ISP, ISP A. I, I also sell mobile network services, okay. that's GSM services, okay. to end users. I do that. At the same time, I have people who are subscribed on my internet access service that are actually using VoIP, like Skype, you know, Skype, to make phone calls. Mm. I find out that my shares in my voice call service is actually being eroded to the, to the advantage of VoIP, like Skype. I can take it, make a decision, a business decision, to say that, okay, since my voice service is at a disadvantage, I'm going to cut off access to applications like Skype so everybody falls back to my voice service. Okay. That's a typical net neutrality issue. Okay. Okay, so now, Leonard, let me come to you. Net neutrality, he has talked about that. How does competition come into this net neutrality issue? Well, the, the, the basic issue of net, net neutrality is discrimination. So that means it's either you're discriminating against a particular traffic or content, or you're discriminating against a particular device, for example. Um, and, and once you, 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 you stray into that realm of discrimination, you're talking about how it affects the players in the market. So that's where competition law comes in. Mm. So for example, like the example he has used, um, if an ISPA, maybe um, an internet service provider, um, on whose service that other con every content user relies on to be able to reach the end user, and then that internet service provider, for example, also owns a content um, marketing or a content producing arm, you know, and you know, for example, content ISPA is here. We have content producers one, two, three. Now, ISP has content producer number three, you know. So that, that raises concern whether the IS, ISP will be fair in dealing with all the content providers, mm. producer, mm. given that it also has interest in that market. Mm. You know? So, for example, it could decide to prioritize the content of the content provider that it, it has interest in. Mm. That's a competition law issue because that's a discriminatory conduct. So, depending on how you're looking at it, if it is where the ISP has a dominant power, it becomes an abuse of dominant um, power of market position. Okay. Now, if it is where it doesn't have, you know, maybe it doesn't have any direct connection with that ISP3, but just has an agreement that allows it to prioritize the traffic of ISP3, of, of content producer 3, then what you have there is a collusive agreement, which lessens competition, because it basically places that content provider in a more advantageous position than the other content producers. And that advantageous position does not derive from any economic efficiency. It just derives from an agreement that was entered into behind the door mm. to say, you know, you see, I have competitors and we all rely on your service to be able to reach the end consumer. But I want you to give me better service and give my competitors, you know, a suboptimal service so that I can reach the consumers better when my competitors are struggling to reach the consumers. That's a competition, that's a typical competition law issue that also, also covers net neutrality. And, and something just actually came to my mind in, in the sense that you could also have this 
ISPs becoming content producers themselves. Yes. And then also discriminating exactly. because of that. But do, do, do we have situations of discrimination among ISPs in Nigeria? Chooks. Thank you. That's a very that's a very good question. You, you know, last time I checked, no regulatory action has been taken against from the from the telecoms regulator you know, against that kind of situation. Very. Oh, so there are instances of discrimination in Nigeria. It will be hard to say it except, hard the, to except see. the regulatory action is taken. Okay, Perfect. Yes. okay, okay. So, but what has been during one of the regulatory? Proceedings in a while back, I think 2010, 2011, dom during a dominance proceeding, there were actually concerns that ISPs or main telcos that had market power in a particular aspect of the telecoms market could actually discriminate. A lot of small players came out to voice that complaint or concern that the bigger telcos could actually discriminate against them because they also compete with them. You know, so but these things are not things that the, the, the telecoms regulator has actually taken a closer look at, but there's been concern in the past as well. But to my mind, at this time, to my mind, I would say that nothing so far has, exists. has come up. Yes. But how does this affect the consumer? Well, how it affects the consumer, for example, it's about consumer experience, like you say. You know, so if the consumers are not getting the right experience or the optimal experience, because some guys behind who are the service providers have entered into some kind of collusive agreement, then it affects the consumer. So the consumer's um, the consumer's right to choice, for example, in choosing which ISP I use, you know, is inhibited. The cost also, because the person who who acquires on due advantage in the market has a tendency to raise the cost. To raise the cost, Go you know. Perfect. So so it goes to cost. It goes to choice. It goes to the quality of the service you enjoy as because a you can put in any any kind of service. And the consumer, the consumer cannot, cannot com complain. Exactly. So it goes it goes it goes into that you know, and you also look at the, at the at the issue of the general issue of innovation, for example, you know. So if if a particular content is throttled, for example, and the consumers don't have optimal experience with it, so it simply means that you know they are stuck with it, you know, and it also means that. The, the provider of that content, no matter how good and innovative they are, will not be able to accelerate innovation and release new products into the market because they are already placed at a disadvantage. You know, so whenever you inhibit competition in any market, you're going to affect consumer in different ways. I mean, the omnibus term is usually consumer welfare. So whether you're looking at the, the choice of the consumer, you're looking at the, the quality, you're looking at innovation, you're looking at um, the cost. For which the consumer pays. That's basically what happens, you know. Now, the, the concept of net neutrality is not already very popular globally um, in Nigeria. It's pop more popular globally. I mean, in America, it was a major issue when Trump came in. They had to roll back some of the regulations, you know. But I bet you, just like we have a competition law, that there are certain practices that are going on right now that until you shine the regulatory light on them, you will not know whether who are having violation of net neutrality in Nigeria or not. But until you shine that regulatory light on them and the regulator carries out the right investigation and comes with a conclusive determination, you know, you cannot say okay. whether these conducts are going on or not. Just but what the NCC has done is to take proactive um, uh, approach measures. in establishing regulations to guide against and Which is what I was going to ask Chooks, because it means that the NCC has to be more, uh, it has to be in search light more on this uh, ISP provider, or ISPs, because ISPs are internet service providers. Uh, so, it means that the NCC has to beam its light more to be able to identify some of these net neutrality issues, isn't it? That, that's exactly what, absolutely. Sometimes when regulatory decisions are taken, it's because of there is a concern that there is an, well, an activity that is being prohibited may arise. So NCC has actually, since 2007, 2017, they came up with a draft rule that incorporates net neutrality provision safeguards, you know, to protect both the consumers, end users like you and I, you know, when, regulate, when regulations are made, it's because the regulator is concerned that certain prohibited conducts may come, may arise, you know, so they take proactive steps to manage that situation. And that's what NCC did exactly by providing, releasing a, a draft code of internet practice. 
that actually spells out net neutrality safeguards to protect end users you know while using the internet and also from content providers you know not to be put in a disadvantage disadvantageous position from bigger players or ISPs. So basically, yes, that's what it means. So uh, the, the, we have the Federal Competition Commission, which is uh, the former CPC. You, you, the, for, the, for the NCC, it has to do with the regulators and the operators, then the consumers, but the consumers have a part to play in this. So does it mean that the FCC has a part to play in this whole issue? Where it concerns protecting consumers. Yes, exactly. You know, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission um, has a wide remit over competition and consumer protection issues across all sectors. And um, what you realize is that uh, there is an overlap between that mandate and the mandate of sector regulators, for example, like NCC, because they also deal with competition and consumer protection in their own sector. Now, but what the new act setting up the FCCPC has provided is for a system of concurrent um, jurisdiction where the, the the competition and consumer protection ca uh, commission now would work with the NCC and other sector regulators to implement a wide range of regulatory um, solve a wide range of regulatory issues. Now, net neutrality is one of them. You know, now like we've said, now as long as this involves dis discrimination that is capable of distorting the market from a competition perspective. Now, the NCC has their competition regulation. The FCCPC has a competition act that they are implementing. So what they will need to do is, under the framework set up under the, uh, the, the new act now, they will have to come together to agree on modalities for addressing issues that affect the sector. So the sector-wide competition regulator and the sector regulator will come together and agree on how to address this. Because sometimes you also find that there are limitations within sector regulatory laws, you know, in dealing with some of these issues. Either the sector law is old or the sector law has not captured certain elements of competition because in all honesty, that's not their primary mandate, you know. So yes, the regime that we have now under the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act envisages a cooperative mechanism for addressing issues where that issue occurs um, in the sector subject to sector regulator. Thank you very much. Uh, Chuks, Chukunyere Izogu and Leonard Ibuaja, they have been our guests today. And uh, we have looked at net neutrality, of course, and competition law, its impact on competition regulation and all that. Thank you for joining us on Talking Point. The program continues.
Pastor, well, now you know more about net neutrality. You know about protection of data. And of course, you know how this affects regulators, operators, and the consumers. We were talking about another industry next week. It's always good doing business with you. I am Imewa Yohyabokai. Have a wonderful week and please be disciplined in your business.